Welcome to our latest webinar for corporates. In this series, we'll be examining recent events and looking ahead at what might be in store for financial markets and the economy. Welcome everybody to the November edition of our webinar. Um, it's been a less turbulent time over the past month or so, or at least over the past few weeks, um, since we've uh, had a change of leadership and I'll be discussing some of the, the potential impact of that uh, before handing over to Piers, and Piers will be doing the technical analysis outlook. But uh, I want to delve straight into this. We've got a lot to get through in a relatively short space of time to do it. Uh, just a summary of the contents of my presentation. I'm going to look at the outlook for growth. We've had updated IMF forecasts. Um, so it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time just to focus on those. Then we'll look at the housing market, which is, I think, one area of concern for central banks, um, particularly because of the cost of mortgage finance in both the UK and the US. It's been climbing steeply, and that can have a material impact on discretionary spending. We'll look at what's happening in interest rate expectations um, after those big rises that we saw over the uh, last couple of months, what happened in October uh, and into early November. Um, before we then move on to the uh, inflation picture, been a couple of surprises there. Look at equities as well. From a fundamental perspective, I think equities might uh, be of interest to central bankers as we go into the end of this year and into the early part of 2023. And it might give us some indication of what might be in store for labour markets in some areas of the uh, financial industry, uh, but also some areas of the tech industry, particularly the tech sector, is one I want to focus on. Before taking a look at our FX market forecasts, um, and then there's a disclaimer at the end, just again reiterating we're not offering advice. So let's plow on into the presentation proper and look at the growth outlook. So these are the October IMF forecasts. On the left-hand side of the updated forecasts, on the right-hand side is how they've changed um, from the, uh, the July numbers. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's, it's noteworthy that there's been a significant downshift in expectations for US growth in 2022 and no uptick for US growth in 2023. So quite a sizable downward revision to what is expected for the US. Um, now we did get some uh, numbers out of the US for Q3 economic activity. That showed growth of around 2.6% annualized for the uh, third quarter, which does unwind quite a lot of the damage that was done over the first couple of quarters. But realistically, the US is on for a pretty anemic year. Um, and that does uh, argue against an ongoing upsurge in interest rates from the Federal Reserve because the economic outlook is likely to be worsened materially from, from here on in. And I think that they're perhaps still overly optimistic about the prospects for 2023 where I see a mild to um, a mildly severe recession coming from the US. Now, notably, there was an uh, an increase in expectations for Euroland and UK economic growth. Now, we've seen the, uh, the Euroland Q3 economic growth numbers, and they've actually outperformed expectations, albeit only marginally. Q3 economic growth up 0.2% quarter on quarter, but it was expected to be broadly flat. UK, we're waiting to get the Q3 numbers. Uh, when they come out, I'm expecting them to be relatively disappointing. Um, and so I'm not sure that that uptrend in, in UK growth from the July figures is, is actually justified. And it's notable that the UK basically stagnates in 2023 alongside Euroland. Um, the other thing to note is some uh, further uh, downgrades to expectations for India and China. Both of those economies do look as if they're still suffering from the post-COVID fallout, China more so than India. We've had some really negative numbers from the PMI surveys from China recently. So just watch out for that, because if China does experience a, a period of economic stagnation, then that could be problematic for the rest of the globe. Finally, in terms of global GDP growth, um, we're expecting uh, an even weaker outturn for 2023, but I still see the there being downside risks there. So if we move on to the next slide and we, we, we look at the housing market. So on the left-hand side, we've got some US housing data here on new home sales, housing starts and existing home sales. And you can see that they've all been trending sh sharply downwards over the course of the last 12 months or so. Moreover, I think it's notable that if we look at mortgage finance in terms of mortgage applications, that's at almost a 25-year low 
as far as the U.S. is concerned. So there are signs, very, very convincing signs, that the U.S. housing market is in a recession. And of course, that will have a potentially negative impact on discretionary spending. The cost of finance, the cost of borrowing generally is higher. Uh, and that means that big ticket items are likely to be less in demand from U.S. consumers. Similarly, if we look at the UK and you look at UK nationwide house prices, um, those fell by 0.9% in the October reading. So that's quite a sharp decline in house prices in one single month. And that's before the full impact of the rate increases has kicked in. So we could see a sizable correction in house prices over the course of the next 12 months, again, having a negative effect on how wealthy people feel and therefore their spending intentions. So two clear indications from the US and the UK housing market that all is not well there and that could have a negative effect on discretionary consumption. Moving on to the next slide, we look at interest rate expectations. Well, they rose very sharply over the course of September and October, but did start to fall back towards the back end of October once Rishi Sunak was uh, installed as the new PM of the UK, and won some of the expectations over fiscal stimulus, both in the UK and in the Eurozone, were scaled back. Um, the, the thing is, though, that we're still expecting UK interest rates to peak above four and three quarter percent. US interest rates are expected to peak at around five percent uh, before falling back. Uh, and European interest rates, the deposit rate, um, is expected to peak around two and a quarter to two and a half percent and the refinancing rate between three and three and a quarter percent. These are very high rates relative to where we've been over the last 14 or 15 years and will have a negative impact, not just on the consumer, but also investment spending intentions. And, and we have seen a downshift in investment spending intentions over the course of the last couple of months. So just watch out to see whether we see a further reduction in interest rate expectations. We still believe that the markets are overpricing the amount and the longevity of high interest rates because of a worsening economic environment, not only domestically, but also globally. Moving on to the next slide, is inflation near its peak? Well, yes, we believe that it is. Um, the UK inflation figures are probably going to uh, peak within the next month or two, somewhere in the ballpark of around 11%. You'll see that Euroland inflation is already close to that 11% region, and though US headline inflation rates are dipping and have fallen back to about 8.2% in the September reading, the, um, the likelihood is, is that we're going to see a further climb in the core inflation rates, excluding um, the volatile elements like food and energy for the next couple of months, which is one of the reasons why we'd expect the Federal Reserve to keep their foot firmly pressed on the break um, by raising interest rates aggressively at tonight's meeting. We're expecting a 75 basis point rate increase from the Federal Reserve, and that ought to be followed up by a 75 basis point increase from the Bank of England as well. But I think beyond that, we might see uh, the pace of monetary tightening slowing um, as the negative economic impact starts to really take hold. And, and we've already seen warnings from that from the European Central Bank. So although it might not look like a peak um, for some of these, uh, the, these indicators, I think we are close to a peak for most of the major economies as far as inflation is concerned. Moving on to the next slide, what's happening in the equity market? Well, it's taking a bit of a hammering to be perfectly honest, and they've taken a hammering because the risk-free rate of money has been climbing steeply um, and continues to climb. So it's no real surprise that you're seeing this slide in the likes of the Dow Jones, in the DAX, in the CAC Caron, uh, and also in the FTSE 100. But it's worthwhile noting that the drop in the Dow Jones has been superseded by the scale of the fall that we've seen in the NASDAQ, which is very tech heavy. Um, and it's tech stocks that do seem to be disproportionately suffering um, with the rise in interest rates, perhaps uh, because many of these tech stocks don't pay dividends. That could be one explanation for it. Not being a, a, um, an expert in equities, I can only really fall back on my macroeconomic experience that just says in a rising interest rate uh, environment, the, the there becomes a scarcity of investment, which is likely to um, lead to those that have been reliant on that investment, tech stocks in particular, suffering more. So 
That added to a poor earnings season for the third quarter, I think has been a significant net negative for equities generally, but particularly in the US. Uh, and although we have seen a bit of a recovery recently in US equities, I'm not really convinced that it's sustainable over the medium to longer term, given the worsening economic environment. So if we move on to the next and hopefully final slide for you, um, uh, other than the disclaimer, of course, these are our updated FX market forecasts. And you can see that there are two asterisks by dollar yen and dollar china. We've seen some pretty aggressive moves in dollar yen and dollar china recently. Dollar china uh, recently breached 7.3, dollar yen breached uh, 150 yen to the dollar. Um, so these forecasts are under review, but clearly um, the market is clouded in both of, of, of these currency pairs because of either direct intervention in the case of the Japanese yen or indirect intervention and manipulation by the Chinese authorities. So we're wary of, uh, of altering our forecasts materially until we better understand what the objectives are of both the Bank of Japan and the People's Bank of China. For sterling dollar, we think that there is the risk of a renewed fall in sterling dollar as we head towards the end of the year. That's really dollar strength rather than sterling weakness. And that in spite of the fact that there are some political events that are likely to uh, create a bit of dollar volatility as well. The midterm elections coming up in the US as an example. For euro dollar as well, there's some short term downside risks but potentially not reaching the previous lows over the next month or two as we, we head into the end of the year. There are some risks as we head into the first quarter of 2023 that the position in, uh, in, in Euroland is economically materially worse than that in the US. The Federal Reserve continue to hike interest rates somewhat more aggressively than the European Central Bank and consequently that widening in the interest rate differential could put some additional short term pressure on euro dollar. Um, so don't rule out a test of 0.9, potentially even a, a move below 0.9 towards 0.86, 0.87. I think that has to be the risk. And the all time lows in euro dollar are around about uh, 82.20. Um, those occurred just after the launch of the euro in the early 2000s. Uh, as for sterling dollar, we did reach 103 and a half. Um, I'm not sure that that is the low for sterling dollar. You may even see a, um, a, a test of parity at some point. Uh, what I would say with a greater conviction, though, is I think that there is well, relatively little upside in the short term for sterling dollar uh, other than what we've already seen. And one final point as far as the foreign, uh, foreign exchange markets are concerned, volatility is still high. Um, and it has been been materially higher than that which we'd seen in 2020 or 2021, that in spite of those big moves that we saw around the COVID and COVID lockdown. So just worthwhile mentioning that volatility levels are materially higher than that which we've observed in previous years. So that's my presentation done. It's 10.15, so I'm bang on, uh, on the money in terms of timing. I'm going to hand you over to Piers. He's going to uh, walk you through his views um, on the technical analysis outlook, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Thank you very much for listening to me, and Piers, over to you. Hi there, Neil. Thanks very much for that. Very fascinating stuff as ever from you. Right. Well, uh, as Neil says, we're short pressed for time, so we'll click on with the slides straight away. And the first chart we have is, as always, I'll start with the dollar index that drives all the FX markets. This was what we had on in April, and we re-put the chart on last month with a warning, a warning of an increased spike on the top side there than the previous quarter. And if we go to the next slide, hopefully you'll see it a bit clearer because I've zoomed in. There, you can see that the price action has come back down this, this quarter. So we have, so far this quarter, a red candle. We've backed off the 76.4% extension and we're backing off that area now i warned that i think there'd be a pullback in the dollar index and i was looking for a pullback towards the 109 well i said 108 110 area we actually stopped at 109.50 so that has happened we've got that first pullback now it's a bit harder because the market's done that pullback is it going to bounce off that 108 110 so if the market decides yes, we want to go higher, 
that's the area it's going to bounce off. So the key areas to watch in the short term are this 108, 110 area, and then just watch that 108, 110 against probably 112, 113. Well, 112, 114. If it just gets above there, then I think it opens up the upside up towards 117. So we need to watch those two levels as we go through 108, 110 as support and 112, 114. Now, if we do get a stronger pullback down lower, we could see a move down towards the 104, 105 area. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that last month was an inside session. So the price didn't print a new high. And it was the first time for quite a few months that we didn't get a higher high in the dollar index. So that sort of shows that people were running out of steam. It's also that 76.4%. So my warning last month is really starting to play out. And I'll just say that if we do get a stronger pullback down, because after an inside session, sometimes it's reversal candle, you do get a bit of a pullback. I think that the most you go down to is probably the 104, 105 area. And either off 104, 105 or 108, 110, I would expect a bounce back up. Now, I have to know where I'm wrong. Where am I wrong? We aren't going to get this rally back up and it's a bit more of a major turn. So I think that would be if we close below 99. 99, 100, if that breaks, then something's changed that I'm not ready for. And it's strange Neil was saying about dollar yen earlier. Uh, you know, their forecasts were 130 and then 122 and saying that this 150 was a big area. I sent out a special on the uh, dollar yen at the start of last month saying that 152, 148, 152 is a very big resistance area. So I'd look for a pullback there and that sort of plays in with this dollar index maybe turning back. If you haven't seen that, get in contact with the salesperson they can get it sent to you, the dollar yen one. So... That's the dollar index. Those are my thoughts on the dollar index. So we go next to euro dollar. Now, this is the slide we had out, and it shows the extensions going down. So we take the first move down from 2008 to 2016, then the rally back up. It stalls at 125 and goes down. Now, a target we had was 0.97. And if we look at the next slide, I've zoomed in, so hopefully you can see it a little bit better. There. So we had that 97.12 as the um, extension, 50% extension. And that was our target once we sort of broke below the 38.2. I said expect some support and we are seeing that support rally back up. But as before, I still think that rallies back up, they struggle if they get towards the 103, 104 area and at a push if they got up towards 107. So, 107, 108, or 103, 104. I think one of those two should contain any rally. And while those two hold, I'm still feeling that we go towards the 61.8% in the bigger picture. So my view hasn't really changed from last month, where I said 97, look for a bit of a rally, maybe up to 103, maybe up to 107.75. But overall, I think at some stage, the, the rally will get sold into and it will push lower, bigger picture. So that's Euro dollar. And if we go to the next slide, this is just to show that we have an inside session. So like on the dollar index, again, price didn't print a new low last month. So there's a good chance we do get a bit of a, a rally back up. But again, look, 102.75 is the first retracement and the 38.2 is up around the 107 area. So that reinforces my feelings of where the resistance should be on any rally. So the next slide we're going to look at is the sterling index. So if you look at sterling, you'll know this is my favourite chart to look at on sterling crosses just because it covers everything in one go. We had the bearish outside quarter earlier this year. Then we saw the move down. Now, we were looking for support at the 23.6, but it broke that and broke the trend line on a closed basis last quarter. However, the one thing I did say, that large spike on the bottom might save this. And I've left those words on this one because it does seem to be rallying off that. But it has some tough work to do. You know, to get positive, you still need to take out that 38.2%. It's held every rally on the sterling index since Brexit. So that's where it has to get above. But there is also a glimmer of hope. If we look at the next slide, you'll see this is the monthly chart. 
Now, the monthly chart in that little bit that I've ringed and put potential morning star on, that's that big spike. Now, I have zoomed in and put it on the top left corner of the screen because this could be something called a morning star where the price is in a downtrend, then it has a push lower with a small body, but then last month we've seen this push back up and close as a positive month. So it takes out the previous month of the negative fall, the red one. So this could be positive for sterling, and we might actually see some follow through higher. Where do we lose that positive feel? If we close below the body of that red candle, the previous red candle, then I think the potential for a rally is sort of disappearing. So sterling does look to have a little bit of strength at the moment for maybe a potential rally. But uh, overall, it doesn't get positive until we're up through that 38.2 area, remember. So we take that into the currencies now and we look at sterling dollar to start with on the next slide. Yeah, this slide. So this is the roadmap, as I call it. This is the, the one that's controlled sterling dollar since 2008, I think, because you have that collapse down since 2008. It rallied back up to that 171.90 area. Then it started going down. And ever since it's been going down, you could put the extensions on and it's shown you where the support and resistance lines should be. So if we go to the next slide, I've zoomed into the last bit just so as we can see a bit clearer. So this is just covering it since 2016. You can see that the rallies stalled at the 38.2% once it broke below there. Each time it's been up there, it's fallen. Then we had the 61.8% line. That sort of held the market on a closed basis. But we had these couple of spikes back in 2016 and 2020, where price went down to the 76.4% and rallied back up off it, never breaking it. But what did we see last quarter with that sort of mini budget fiasco? Price went below there. Now, the problem was it was a bit of a flash crash. And I never like flash crash in Asian trading hours for a sterling cross. And so we have a spike on the bottom again, like the previous two. So we are seeing a bit of a rally back up and price is still working, uh, still sort of finding support around that 113.40 area. So it's not a clear break at this stage, but it shows you the market is still willing to sell. And it shows you another thing. You are still in a downtrend because you are still making lower lows and lower highs in this. But everyone's always looking for the rally. Everyone always looked for the rally in sterling dollar. You know, I always remember since we've come down from two, people, oh, when did we go back to two when you were 180? And then you went to 150. When do we go back to 160? And then you're 140. When do we go back to 150? Then it goes to 130. Oh, when do we go back to 140? And when you're at 120, oh, when do we go back to 130? And you get to 110. When do we go back to 120? So it sort of shows people are always looking for that. Can we get back up to an area where we can buy their dollars. But this is the point. I think people will buy them as soon as you get a bit of a rally. And so it still makes me feel we're in a downtrend overall. So if we go to the next slide, here we go. Let's look at the retracement. So this is going to help us work out if the rally is anything more than just a counter trend move before it goes back lower. So on this chart, I've taken the absolute high, absolute low. So this is textbook charting. You take the absolute high, which back in sort of 2021 was up near sort of 142 area. And we take the absolute low, 103.47. And you can see that the 38.2% is around about the 118.30 area. So we could see some resistance come in at 118.30. However, I'm as I said to you earlier, I'm not happy with that flash crash. It was there for such a short period of time. I've heard some people say it was only there minutes and then it rushed back up. So I'm going to go to the next slide where what you can do, a different way of doing it, not the textbook rule, but a way I found works quite well, is to take the high, where we know it's good trading price, to the low of last month, because we know the low was last month was a good trading price. So if we put on to that level, we can see that 117 
is the first retracement. So that's not too far off 118. So it still says that 117, 118 area should be resistance. But the 38.2 then comes in at the 122, nearly 122 area. Now, I gave last month 118 and 123 as strong areas of resistance. So I'd stay with that at the moment. At the moment on sterling dollar, I feel that rallies back up into those areas should find some selling. And only above 123.60 would I start to get a bit more positive that this is a stronger move coming back. So if we go to the next slide now, we can look at euro sterling. So this is euro sterling on the um, quarterly chart. So this is a chart I put on last month. And on that, I put these lines of uh, 88.95 down to 85, saying that price really is caught between those two. And if you look back, it's just a sideways market. It's just gone sideways for years. So we sort of went up towards the top part and it came back down. So last month on the webinar, we're coming off the 88.95. I said maybe a test down towards the 85, and we're sort of seeing that play out. But those are the key areas I've watched, especially on a quarterly chart, to show are things starting to change on euro sterling. Now, on the next slide, because it's a long time to wait for the quarter, I've put the monthly chart on. So on the monthly chart, the highest monthly close we had was 92.10. And you can see we bounced off that area last month. Sorry, the month before last in that flash crash where sterling weakened, it went up to that 92.10 area, fell off again. So I'd watch at the moment the 87.95, let's say 88. 88 as a sort of warning signal. If you got above there on a monthly close, then maybe we're going to start to see euro sterling go higher. But at the moment, it looks like it might be having a test down towards sort of the 83.60, 82.5 area. Test down there, but it hasn't broken that range for a long time. Look at it, 2016, 2022. You've had nearly eight years just going between those ranges. So just go keep with the range. I was once taught when something's range trading, just trade it and then go with the break. And I think that's the story here. So on the next chart, because Neil assures me lots of people like looking at sterling euro. So here's the sterling euro basis. So on this one, I gave the quarterly chart sort of down in the 112 area as the support and the resistance up sort of just underneath 118. So we need to watch those on the quarterly basis. But if we flip on to the next slide, here it is on the monthly basis. So again, look, the same sort of thing, obviously, as, as before. We can see that the 119, 122 area has capped all the rallies since the collapse of Brexit. So that's the area you need to get above to signal a stronger move higher. On the downside, we can see, look, that lowest monthly close we had before was 108 and a half. And in that pink circle on the bottom, if you draw that line, I've drawn the line across, and if you look at that, that's held every dip down. So that's where you start to get concerned that sterling euro is probably gonna have to go for parity if you go below that 108.50. But at the moment, support is at the 113.70. You know, we can see it didn't close below there for the last couple of months. Last month was a sort of positive month. So maybe a little bit of a test, test up higher. But we do have the Bank of England tomorrow, so that could throw a spanner into anything, you know, so. Thanks very much for listening to the webinar. We hope you found it informative. The next in the series will be available shortly.